From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's going on? It's Wake Up War Chant. It is presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill in Tallahassee, Florida. CPTallyBar.com. QR code everywhere. Scan it. Takes you right to the website. You can place your order online. Pick it up. Nice and easy peasy. Third Wednesday of every month, Corey, do you know, is, is Parrot Head Flocking. Yeah. No. What does that even mean? I don't know, man. Check it out. Something about the Tallahassee Parrot Head website. I guess, like, is there a big Jimmy Buffett contingent that goes with the CP? I mean, maybe. Uh, I don't remember seeing that. But look, man, it's a perfect place for a, if you're a Jimmy Buffett fan or if you're a Tool fan mm. or a uh, Dixie Chicks fan or a, a Spice Girls fan. Oh. It doesn't matter, man. They're all welcome at the corner pocket. Jay-Z fan. You're, they're, they're all welcome at the corner pocket. And shout out to uh, Stephanie, who... Um, I guess took my uh, took my cue a couple weeks ago and actually volunteered to host trivia on Tuesday night because the regular trivia guy was out sick. So uh, Stephanie stepped up the plate and uh, delivered a little trivia for the uh, for the uh, the patrons there at uh, Corner Pocket. Do you want to let us know some of the questions you gave her to ask? Yeah, I gave her a March Madness round. Uh, So ask yourselves this, folks. Who did Christian Leitner beat? with his buzzer-beating shot in the 1992 Elite Eight. That was one. That was kind of the gimme, I thought. Uh, who did Florida State upset? What number one seed did Florida State upset in the second round of the 2018 NCAA tournament? That was another. And then I'll give you one last one. Who was the last undefeated team to win the NCAA tournament? And what year did they do it? Those are the, uh, those are the three that I, that I I gave her five, so those were three of the five that I gave her. Oh, by the way, speaking of trivia, our guy, JT Knowles, 2K2 or whatever, that asked us, he gave us like three trivia questions. We crushed two of the three. The one about which team is, did Bobby Bowden beat the most? You were right. It was Florida. Oh, there you go. How yeah. about that? That's crazy. Because he had a stretch where he didn't. He lost to him six years in a row, twice. Yeah. Yeah. So. Didn't matter, though. He still it, Those in-between years were pretty darn good to the Knowles. That's right. All right. Uh, we're going to get to a lot of... Uh, Football stuff here uh, momentarily. Lots of observations. Got the notepad in front of me. Corey uh, doled out some observations. But a reminder, the spring game is April 9th, and you're going to want to hang out with us the entire weekend. The happy hour, the War Chant happy hour, makes a triumphant return in 2022, Friday, the day before the Garnet and Gold game, over at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Jeff Cameron, Corey Clark, live at the Corner Pocket, 5 to 6 p.m. Friday. I think we'll also be perhaps mingling around doing some meet and greet stuff there that mm. night. Gene Williams, Tom Lang, maybe we get Ira out there. Maybe I'll go as well. And mm. then Saturday game day over at the hotel Indigo. I, I don't know if we can call it the official hotel of warchant.com, but we'll be over at the hotel Indigo uh, from 12 to three doing some meet and greet stuff. And then Jeff, I'm sorry, Gene and Tom rather are going to do a watch along over at the hotel Indigo. And then they'll have their post-game call-in show after the Garnet and Gold game. So I'll run that by again for you folks. Meet and greet starts at noon Saturday at Hotel Indigo, 1 o'clock, pre-game show with Jeff and Tom. Then 5, the watch-along with Gene and Tom. And then a post-game call-in show afterwards. And then Friday night, come hang out at the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Hope that all made sense. Write it down, rewind it. It'll all make sense. We'll be talking about it uh, a lot probably in the next couple weeks. Yeah. Most likely. All right, Corey, let's get to it. After a nine-day hiatus, uh, mm. back at it, the Florida State football team at spring ball. I think they got ten more of these left now, scrimmages, everything. Um, observations you posted, uh, but I guess let's get kind of to the news of the day, if there was news, which I think really the only thing that was on most people's mind was what's going on with Winston Wright. Uh, Norvell did confirm that he was involved in an automobile accident but didn't give a lot of details on the status of him, his his fate uh, when it comes to playing football this season. Something about going to be out for the short term for an extended period of time. Yeah, um, he's going to be out for an extended period of time in the short term. So, guys, do with that what you will. Man, short term could be like, you know, yeah. is that a month? Is that four years? Like, every, everybody's got a different perspective on time, right? Yeah, 
I, you know, I don't want to criticize him because everybody loves him, but just I wish he would figure out maybe a way he wants to communicate injuries to us. Like I'll do, we'll do it off camera. Like we don't have to put you on camera. Like, he wants to tell us on the record, but off camera, like what's going on with uh, an injury because that's yeah, it's kind of a weird explanation. But I guess we get it. He's out for spring, everybody. Um, I mean, he didn't say yeah. that, but that's that's the case. We'll see if he gets back in time for summer preseason. Um, again, it's just I hate to say I mean, all we could do is speculate. I don't want to speculate. So anyhow, that's he, he did address that part of things. So otherwise, we really didn't ask a lot of good questions. All of us on the beat. Very bad day. A lot of us didn't check out a spring break. So we didn't have much for uh, questions to ask Norvell. So I guess let's get to the observation. Then, Corey, unless does that change your mind on anything? I mean, was that information on Winston Wright? Did that give you any clarity of what that means for him? And does it affect your, your thoughts about the offense and what he can be? Well, here's what I would say, just reading between the lines. Um, if, if he was definitely expecting Winston Wright to be back in the fall, like be ready in the summer for summer conditioning and preseason practice and then getting into the pra- actual practice in August and then the games, I feel like that would have been communicated. Um, I have a, I, I just got the impression that, yeah, I'm not expecting him to play. And this is pure speculation. Don't, trust me, I don't have any inside knowledge. I never do. Um, I'm not that guy. <laughs> he does. Um, he does. He's being but I, no, when the, in this, it just, I feel like if it was going to be three months and he's ready to go by June 10th, June 30th, um, July 5th, whatever, that uh, we would have known that. Like, hey, he should be good for the fall. We're so happy he's healthy that he that he survived because that's what Norvell said is like. Look, you see the accident. The first things first. It's 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 you know it's great that he that he survived and he's still here. Um, so that's number one. But then he did say that he's coming back to Tallahassee. They FaceTimed him on Sunday when they did the locker room reveal. Um, so he's still a part of the team. And I you know I stressed like I even I even said like so he's coming back to Tallahassee. Yeah. I was hoping that open up a little. Yeah, and he'll be practicing in uh, August, but yeah. that didn't happen. But he did confirm that he is coming back to Tallahassee here soon. Again, soon in quotes, whatever that means. I thought he said but this I, week. He did not say Maybe, that. yeah, maybe. But, like, as far as, like, you know, he's out for an extended period of time in the short term, I, I just don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, I would assume just the, because what, what wasn't said, which was he should be okay and ready to go by August. Or July. See, I don't or he know. Should... I don't even think he would say that. He he maybe not. Does You're not right. Like so, talking about but, but, injuries, it's really so that. Awkward. But that's the issue yeah. when he's when you're vague about something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and again, we get to watch every second of practice, so it's it's hard to criticize him with um, with how he deals with the media. But in this particular instance, we're just left to guess. Um, and so I might be completely wrong. That was just the feeling I got. But I get a lot of wrong feelings. I'm divorced. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's there's plenty of proof out there. Um, so not that Shanna was a wrong, you know, that was a good feeling. We, we were in love Aslan. Uh, let me take you back. It was fall of 1997. I want a whole show. I want a whole show. I want like an hour long show about your guys' relationship, but I me want and both Shanna, me and Shanna. Yeah, yeah. We, it won't be this show, but we will do it during the summer doldrums. Maybe we can have her on. Okay. Um, that'd be fun. Uh, she'd have some, she has some stories for all you guys. I think I'd, love be, them. I'd be a good mediator. I think I'd, I'd be, I'd, I'd let her talk, say her piece and you try to interrupt it. Hey, let her finish, let her finish. And then I'd let you, you know, I think I'd do well on it. But anyhow, carry on. Sure. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I was just left to speculate that. Okay. It didn't sound like Winston Wright might be a huge part of their plans, but again, I could be completely wrong, but that's what I got from it. But either way, yes, the most important news is that, um, he will be back to in Tallahassee. So he is, um, able to travel. Um, don't even know if he's in a hospital right now. Don't really know anything about him. Um, and yeah, so we'll see, but yeah, it it might be, it might not be the year for Winston Wright here in in Tallahassee. But does it matter when Darian Williamson and Ja'Kai Douglas and Mm. I mean, Pokey's making catches out there on, on Tuesday. And I say that jokingly, we obviously want the best for Winston Wright. Hope he makes it back into playing football here and has a nice life that's uninterrupted overall by that. But uh, so what do you want to take away? How do you want to steer this? Where do you want to go? Observations, Um, offense, receivers still just kind of impressing you with uh, their ability to make plays, something that we didn't see a lot of 12 months ago. Yeah, you know, there were. Yeah, um, sure. Um, We we can start there. That's fine. Uh, You know, I do like, uh, again, Ja'Kai. In in seven on seven and in one on ones, especially one on ones. I you know again he was you know the kid that was trying to guard him 
He's a redshirt freshman, didn't have a chance. But he's really tough. He is a tough matchup for a cornerback. He is quick. He is elusive. Um, he's fast. Like he's got all those things. I it didn't translate so much in the eleven on eleven on Tuesday. But then again, I don't know. He might have been open. They didn't see him. He might have been a you know. They, he didn't. It's not like he was terrible. I don't. I just don't remember him catching anything in eleven on eleven. But seven on seven and in one on ones, he was the best guy on the field. And again, if you're wondering about Winston Wright and his availability. Every time, every practice I watch Ja'Kai Douglas, I think, okay, this guy, th he might be a 50-catch guy. They, He's a guy you need to get the ball in his hands. Like, he is a good player. He looks like a really good player, and he's had some big moments. So it's not like you wonder if he can do it on a big stage. He had an 80-yard touchdown against Notre Dame. He had the big catch against Miami uh, in the last two minutes. He's made big plays already. So, uh, yeah, man, I, I'm just really encouraged by him. Uh, Portier had a couple nice back shoulder. One was like a back hip. Uh, catch, um, you know, one, one maybe the best, well most well placed ball, but he still caught it. Um, I, yeah, and Williamson did all right too. I, I thought all of them. McLean made a, a contested catch. Um, Pittman was the only one really, um, and it's not like he played poorly. I just don't remember him doing anything. But Johnny Wilson had a big catch over the middle. Like almost every other receiver made a play besides uh, besides Micah Pittman. But that doesn't mean he was playing poorly. I just don't remember seeing him uh, do much of anything on Tuesday. But yes, again. The, the Portier made a, pl a catch in seven on seven on that back shoulder, back hip throw, um, which was not a very good throw. I didn't think it was a very good throw, but he stopped and made a really impressive catch. One of those where the whole sideline like hoots it up, mm. one of those plays. Oh. And I'm telling you, they did not do that. They wouldn't do that once a week last year during spring. Maybe once a week they'd have a catch like that. Even on Tuesday, which I didn't think the receivers were great. But even on Tuesday, in a not great day for them, they had four or five of them. So again, it's just a little bit better. It's a little bit better than it was. It might be a lot better. We, we don't know, but it's certainly better. Yeah, check out the Jeff Cameron show for uh, Trench Insight. Uh, Tom Lang was checking out, was going off the defensive ends and the pass rush because they were doing pass rush drills while they're doing seven-on-seven, seven, one one-on-one kind of stuff. Um, I just always found it kind of tough to decipher what's going on with pass rush because – like, everyone just gets dapped up afterwards. Like, all right, well, so who won? And it's like, all right, well, Jared Verse just blew off the ball. But it's like, was that the right gap? Was he allowed to go that wide? Was he told he can't go that wide? But anyway, right. um, I digress. So we don't have a lot of defensive observations for him. But he was a guy that we did see flash in 11-on-11, uh, disrupting some plays there in the backfield. Leonard Warner as well, also getting involved. Yeah, we'll talk man. about him a little bit later. Um but, yeah, one-on-ones for me is a weird thing because I feel it's almost like BP. It's just like, all right, it's, everything is tailor-made for the offense. But uh, the numbers that I did write down, uh, Brendan Gant, I think it was Brendan Gant. It might have been Shaheen Brown, but I'm pretty sure it was Brendan Gant. Had a PBU, so good for him. Uh, Pokey and Ja'Kai, both with good catches. I uh, actually did have Micah Pittman for a good catch in one-on-ones. Uh, a good pass breakup by Sam McCall. He's a guy that's steadily putting together some good days that's really encouraging to see jarian jones my guy out there with good coverage and one-on-ones nice pass breakup by renardo green and white rector had a nice catch mm. in one-on-one so that's what i had there seven on seven though uh jakai's got the check plus uh, Keyshawn helton had a nice catch with jordan travis at the helm he got a check plus um that was something very encouraging. What do you think about Tate Rodemaker? Had Tate hooking up with Johnny Wilson on a good on a good throw and catch. Um, I thought honestly, uh, in the seven on a seven and eleven on eleven, those two combined, and I added those up, Aslan, in my observations. I've got the stats, the 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 completions, and about roughly the yardage. Um, and uh, and yeah, man, I thought I thought Tate was the, for for most of the practice was the best quarterback. Um, again. I'm, I we're don't not, agree we're, with that. We're not. We're not saying. I'm not saying that he's winning the job, but I thought by uh, by and large, other than one bad throw, he was the best quarterback that day. Which is now three good practices in a row for that dude. Even after, and even whether you think he wasn't the best quarterback of the day or not, um, he certainly wasn't an embarrassment. He was good. He, I mean, he was he was 12 of 17 for 200 yards, um, and Jordan Travis was like 11 of 16 for 100. So it's the way he's throwing the ball. It's not just the numbers, because again, these numbers are goofy. It's seven on seven. You throw, like Jordan Travis throws a little swing pass to a running back. I don't know if it was a 20-yard gain or a nine-yard gain, because they're not tackling. But I just guesstimate. But Tate Rodemaker is ripping the ball down the middle of the field. That He had a 50-yard pass to Darian Williamson. 
he had a really nice throw to Johnny Wilson, um, about a 30-yard seam route. And I thought his two best throws were his last two throws where he rolls to his right, ro rolling kind of hard because he's avoiding pressure. This is an 11 on 11. And he hits Portier right between the two eights on the sidelines. It, one of those where he's rolling right almost at full speed and whips it right at him. And then the very next play, he rolls to the left and makes the exact same throw for another first down. Again, he's just taking steps. And he looks like a legitimate quarterback. I might be the craziest person in the world. And we talked about it on headlines, too. Like, none of this really matters anymore. We have to see what he looks like on April 9th. Yeah. Well, and I know... Game, really, but yeah. Well, no, enough. but no, I think that's the... Right? That's the closest facsimile you can get. Because yeah. last year in the spring game, he was not good at all. And now... He's going to have Corey Clark propping him up for the next three weeks. Apparently, that's all I'm going to write about. So he's going to have all these expectations to like to, to show actual fans. This is and fans are going to want to see. Okay, well, how good is Tate Rodemaker? Is he really a legitimate backup guy? Is, they don't need to go in the portal. Let's see what this Tate Rodemaker looks like. There will be genuine pressure on that kid on that spring game. Shouldn't be. It's a spring game, right? But it matters, and it definitely matters to him. So if he has a neck, if he keeps practicing like this. Where they feel, where he looks good. I'm telling you, he just looks good. And then he goes and wets the bed in the spring game. Well, then you you might be to the point where you're like, okay, he just can't do it when it matters, when the lights are on. Now the lights are dim in a spring game. They're not bright. They're not all the way on. This isn't LSU and the Superdome. But don't you think that's telling how he performs in that? Because he's been good, good to fine um, in, in these last three practices. And I think I think if he goes out there and plays really well in the spring game. That tells you something. And if he regresses and does not play well at all in kind of the moment, even a stupid spring game is too big for him, then I think that tells you even more. Don't you? That's fair. I would say that. I mean, I saw a couple of people comment on a couple of the podcasts the other week about, hey, we get it, but we need to see it in a game with him. Like he can, he's, he's great at practice. Cool. Because I think Jeff was a guy that was talking a lot about he liked the way that Tate looked and the way Tate throws the ball. Because Tate does look good, man. Like, if you see Tate go through individual drills where the quarterbacks are just kind of throwing amongst each other or doing their footwork, uh, I mean, he, he looks really sharp and crisp. And then kind of when you roll him out in the more, you know, game stress situations, like he looks good on one-on-one, -on -one, he looks good on seven-on-seven. Eleven-on-eleven, not as sharp sometimes. And you're like, well, that's the kind of closest thing to a game. Yeah, but I didn't think that was the case on – I thought he was the best of the 11-11 guys on – I thought he was the best of the quarterbacks on 11-11s. On I just did. I, I th and what I like about it – and think about the 7-on-7s, seven seven, Aslan, how mad you get when Duffy tucks it and runs. Well, no, man, I mean, everybody had – I mean, he had the least out of all those three quarterbacks. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't know that he had one. And he, he might have he had one. one. He did have one. But w when he sees it, he's ripping it now. Which again, sometimes he I, he might rip it to a linebacker. He he did throw a pick on Tuesday. Um, he I looked like Fuller Fuller hit him as he was throwing it or was close to him. He had to get rid of it. Quashawn Fuller was right in his face or coming at him. It looked like his arm was hit, but maybe not. Either way, he rushed the throw and it was underthrown and Greedy Vance intercepted. It's a good play by Greedy, but he threw it right to him. But then Jordan Travis threw into double coverage twice. Um, one of them should have been intercepted. Another one was thrown too short to be intercepted. So it wasn't like either – it wasn't like Jordan outplayed him. And, again, I think that's a good thing because there is no question who the starting quarterback is. But, man, it would be nice if Tate not put pressure on him because there's not going to be any real pressure on Jordan Travis. But to, to show that, yeah, man, he's, he's made some legitimate strides. Again, I was just impressed with the guy. Three yeah. practices in a row. That's why, I mean, you're, you're – you know, that's your prerogative for sure, man. I mean, I'm – I just think like when we're talking, you're talking about him like ripping the balls. It's like it's seven on seven. There's there's no pass rush. There's there's so many clean, easy windows to throw to. Credit to him for making it happen. What I was trying to get to at the previous point was I understand people want to see him execute this in a game, and we've heard him look good in practice, but he he did not look as competent in practice last year as he does right, right. now. Right. So Ex that gives absolutely. you hope to think that if he does get put into thrust into a game situation. You know, he can hold down the fort a few drives, maybe a week, maybe a whole game, maybe sure. two games. It's also got to – it's so. got to help, too, that he's not – you know, they had four guys taking a lot of reps last spring. Right. Well, no, Chubb, was Chubb a practice in last spring? I don't remember. I don't think so. Pro no, I don't even think yeah. he was here. No, he wasn't – yeah, that's right. He wasn't even Yeah, in that's town. right. Yeah. So he was getting the same amount of reps uh, last year as he, as he was this year, but he's getting reps with better players Yeah. Um, now than he was last year. A.J. Duffy is kind of going through – 
what Rodemaker had to go through last year with like working with a bunch of third teamers, especially on the offensive line. Well, but the before thing we, though is, the thing though is oh, not only is he working with sec, you know, quote unquote second teamers. Like those second teamers are more talented than I mean, last yes, year he was yeah. he was doing he was work, he was running with the threes. And the threes were nowhere near as good as the threes this year, let alone the twos this yeah, year. Yeah, the threes so. were like Parker Self and uh, Burrell before he got yeah, hurt or something like Parker that. Where is Parker Self? Is he still on the team? I got no, team. no. Man, if he was on the team, you know. Parker Self yeah, would let you know. Not. Oh, man, what a bummer. Fernando yeah, Padron, that's the new guy. That's the new mm, okay. uh, flavor du jour. Right. So, uh, so yeah, man, I, and, I, and I was going to say, though, uh, you know, Duffy, uh, again, it's so hard to judge all of them, really, because they're not working with the same players. And against the same and against the same players, so uh, it's hard to know. You know, Duffy. You know, he 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 was holding it a lot in seven on seven and not throwing. He was having to he was having to run a lot. But then there was one play where a receiver was on the ground in seven on seven. There's the other times where the guys maybe are running the wrong route or just are not open. He has nowhere to throw it, so it's hard to really judge. Um, but I didn't think he had a great day overall. But I thought he made the two best throws of the day. That that's that's where this kid kind of wow he has these wow plays um and i don't know if you saw the one aslan where it was uh it was in 11 on 11 he ra he was sprinting to his right um because he had to get he had to get around the rush so he's sprinting to the right and it's one of those throws where it looks like okay he's just going to throw it out of bounds he's he's trying to get rid of the ball to not get sacked but no he throws a dime i don't know 35 yards downfield down the sideline over a defender to do span. Yeah, who, I saw that one. Yeah. Who didn't even look like he was looking for the ball at first because he thought the play was over, and then he uh, he turns around, and then there's, oh, it's right in my hands. That was a really good play. To have that kind of touch and accuracy when you're sprinting to your right and to have the arm strength to make that kind of throw was really impressive. And then his next series, he made another play where it's just, it's kind of this innate stuff that some guys just have. He's, he's rolling out to his left. There's a rusher that's coming at him that's trying to meet, you know, he sees him running, so he's going to try to meet him at the, you know, they're going to, you know, he's he's aiming towards out in front of him. The the rusher is to try to meet him. He's not running right at him. He's, he sees where he's running. He's going to try to beat him to the spot. It was a long way to say that. I'm sorry. So he's running. The rusher's trying to beat him to the spot. Duffy sees it and stops on a dime, like stops on a dime. The guy runs by him almost, essentially by him, and Duffy uh, rips one about 18 yards rolling to his left kind of across his body in the middle of the field to Burrell, which yeah. is just a – that was that was probably the most impressive thing I saw from the quarterbacks, one single play. Just being able to roll to your left like that, make a guy miss, and as you're making a miss, your head is still downfield, and you have, the again, the arm strength and the accuracy to make a throw like that was just really impressive. And he does that once or twice a, a practice where he makes a throw where you're like, okay, yeah, man, he really might be something someday. Yeah, I think I've got – Five, four. I've got four check plus plays offensively completions. Uh, I got Jordan Travis with one to Malik McLean. Then the aforementioned throws you mentioned from Duffy to Deuce Span uh, and Josh Burrell. And then I had uh, Tate's throw uh, to Kentron Portier. I think it was a little bit maybe the back shoulder one that he had, or might yeah, the one he yeah. So again, it's it just this I think is kind of a good exercise everybody because I think Corey and I both grade on a different kind of scale um, because yeah like we'll see a, a screen pass and Corey like man that was way to throw it in the right spot to lead your guy on a screen play that's twelve yards that's a first down and I'm like okay probably maybe but like I want to see like more verticality like more big chunk play kind of stuff oh so, sure sure. Um, well, not that you do not. It's just it's, but, you know, it's so just that, interesting but, as we're talking about stuff in real time when we're out at practice and then we come in yeah. and share these. And operations. trust me, everyone, Aslan has to be my eyes because I can't see anything on the other side of the field. I mean, I can see what's happening, but I have no idea who's catching it. I barely have any idea who's throwing it. I barely I have any idea what team is practicing. That's how bad my eyesight is. And I keep leaving my binoculars in Atlanta, so I, I got to adjust there. You got to do LASIK? Um, Would you do LASIK? Everyone's man, I just don't LASIK. want... I, I no, I'd rather wear glasses. Okay. I mean, I can pull glasses off, don't you think? Yeah. With yeah, this bod, absolutely. It goes well. Bald guys and glasses, people love that. It's a great look. My dad um, loves that. But uh, yeah, so that throw to Helton that you were talking about that Travis hit to Helton. Well, look, Helton was wide open, and it was a it was probably a thirty. I had him. I think I put it down for like a thirty-five yard gain. He was wide open in the middle of the field. It's not like Travis had to make a great, incredible throw to get it to Keyshawn Helton, or even if he ran a great route. He was just it was a coverage bust. And he's wide open in the middle of the field. And there's nobody within 15 yards of him. But the beauty is he saw it, and he saw it quickly. There is something to that, too. Like, 
there there's and you know and I'm not I'm not I'm not telling you just there's more to playing quarterback than just throwing these incredible AJ Duffy throws over a defender right down I mean the simple throws are what matter almost as much as that's what Brady I mean I know Brady's incredibly talented and he makes it look easier than it is but he also is really good or has been in his career really good at the simple throws whoever's open he gets it to him and he gets it to him quick and what I was really impressed with Travis on Tuesday was he's really good and it, again like you said it, it's it's a it's a it's a one yard pass in actuality the ball travels one yard past the line of scrimmage but man it makes so much difference if you if the guy that's running the uh the screen pass or the the you know whatever the shallow cross if you can lead him right where he needs to be so he can turn it up field right when he's supposed to and catch it it's the difference between i don't know a four yard gain and a 12 yard gain and I thought Jordan, you know, I, I was I didn't like what he did throwing the ball downfield on Tuesday, but all that stuff, the quick stuff, in the in the screen game stuff, it does matter to get it to him in a good spot and not just throw it at their body or throw it behind them. And he was leading them really well, I thought, all day on that stuff. Uh, um, I think he had Treshawn had a couple. The the walk on number twenty two had a nice one. Um, C J Campbell, yeah, yeah man. C J Campbell. Campbell, man, he's got a little burst to him. That That's kid, he juice. keeps making plays. So. Uh, so yeah, I thought overall, I thought the quarterbacks were good. Again, uh, again, good-ish. You know, it's not th 2013 good, but good for what we've been used to around here. The madness, everybody, has officially begun. It is time for you to shoot your shot. The metaphor of it, obviously, and that's by betting and scoring big on the nonstop action over at mybookie.ag. Doesn't matter whether you're filling out multiple brackets, betting the national championship winner, or maybe just looking for some player and game props. MyBookie has you covered first half props sometimes maybe first half under iowa state miami maybe you want that one sign up today at my bookie and use the promo code WarChant to secure a first deposit bonus up to one thousand dollars it's simple put in two hundred dollars you can play with three hundred just use the promo code WarChant to claim your bonus college nba ufc the fight game no matter the sport no matter the minute my bookie puts the action in your hands with in-game live betting and with choices of thousands of lines and odds that you can turn any game day into a payday. Right now, Corey, uh, the odds to win the national championship in college football, Florida State is plus 28,000. So Ooh. if we were, if we were to put $100 on that and watch it happen, we'd win 28,000 American dollars. I don't even want to tell you the amount of teams that have better odds than Florida State. It's, what if we just put 50 on it? I'll take 14 grand. Yeah. Yeah, fourteen grand exactly. That's what would happen. So if we put a thousand on it, if we put a thousand on Florida State to win the national championship, we would win two hundred eighty thousand dollars. Correct. Guys, what are we doing? I mean, we're gonna do a live show. Maybe all the super chats will go to that. There's just but so. All right, many. so let me ask you this, Aslan. Legitimately, so yeah. let's say we do that. We put a thousand dollars on Florida State to win the national championship. Or I do. You do. No, you do. Okay. And they make it to the playoff. They go 12-0, and 0 and they make it to the playoff, and they're playing Georgia. What do you put, what do you bet on Georgia to hedge the $280,000 that's on the line? What could you scrap together to scrounge together with your friends? They're getting a return because either way, you're winning, right? So what, 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 what do you think the number is that you would hedge to, to could you get to like 20000 Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I think if you could, and I know it's really hard for all of us to do, 100000 I mean, you got to hedge that thing. You're yeah. guaranteed of at least winning $100,000 on a sports bet. That's awesome. Oh, man. Bet anything, right. anytime, <laughs> anywhere with mybookie.ag. Again, defensively, not a lot of stuff to send your way. Shout out to uh, to Maury Tate. He had a, he had a pass breakup. Batted a ball down at the line of scrimmage on 11 on 11. Uh, Corey mentioned earlier, Greedy Vance had an interception. I think that was maybe the only interception. Yeah, of it was. Consequence, yeah. So, um, and I mentioned the guys in one on one that kind of showed up. Uh, you know, Jamie's out there, Duke Cooper's out there, all the guys are out there. Akeem Dent just makes you think he's an All American some days, and then other days you're like, man, what what, what should have been? But hey, he's he out does there it battling. between plays. Yeah, it's incredible. He does it from play to play. Yeah. What do we think about Leonard Warner? Uh, you know, I brought it up during the, yeah. the round table. Uh, he's, and you know, we heard from the coaches during the uh, the luncheon about 
yeah, that's a guy that we think we, we can get something out of. Um, I think they almost even had a little bit more positive stuff to say than, than merely that. He's he's part of the plans. It's it's incredible because last year, you know, he was wearing a green polo during games. He was hurt. I mean, he did yeah. put weight on. You know, Norvell said after practice he was kind of a heavy linebacker to start off with, so they kind of had to transform his body. But, yeah, last year he was a quasi-coach. He wore a green polo and was helping either signal in plays or help communicating stuff during huddles. Uh, while the offense was on the field, uh, and now he's out there seeing significant sort of action. It's it's pretty cool, man, and um, I don't know. We're not talking about him enough when we're talking about defensive ends who we need to start. Because uh, I know we, we go to, when we think about defensive ends, we think about pass rush. Maybe that's yeah. not his thing, but if he can give us something close, a reasonable facsimile, as you guys like saying, uh, to like mm. a Kier, that's, that's a hell of a game. It's a huge oh game. well, yeah, that would be that would be incredible if he's even anywhere close to that. But yeah, man, you know you forget about him. At least I mean, why wouldn't you? He hasn't played in two years. Um, even when he played, he wasn't all that memorable. No offense, Leonard, um, but you weren't. Um, and he's he's kind of an afterthought. And then on Tuesday, um, you know, I think there was a like two or three plays in a row where he had a tackle for a loss. He made he he had a really good play where he pushed the tackle up high outside and made the running back have to cut it back, and then he batted down a pass. Yeah, he tipped um, the ball that was caught for like a loss Yeah, of five, for like a yards. minus eight yeah. yards. Yeah, so he tipped the pass, which is always good to see too. I love that stuff. Florida State doesn't do that nearly enough. But, um, but yeah, I thought that was, I, I thought that was uh, encouraging. I, again, don't, don't worry. We're not going to sit here and tell you that Leonard Warner is going to be the difference in this Florida State defense, but – there's nothing that says that he can't be a contributor. And it might not – I know you hear that and go, good grief. Is that how bad it is at defensive end that Leonard Warner the third is, is going to be a, a, a key member of this rotation? Well, man, look, he, he's, he's, kinda, he's still new to the position, and he's still getting his body back. You know, he's, he, hasn't, he didn't get to play at all last year. So maybe there is something there. He certainly wasn't doing it at linebacker, but maybe there is something. He's still a, a fresh defensive end. I know he's old, but he hasn't been playing the position long. Maybe he really t has taken a next step and, and actually can be something at defensive end. Not just a body, because they got bodies. Maybe somebody that, a productive body would be nice. Uh, but yeah, he's not going to be a 10 sack guy. I don't even know how much he's going to play. But he did, I mean, they're playing him a lot. And they're playing him with other guys that we, play, we, we assume will be starting for this team. So they do seem to like what they've seen so far from this guy, for sure. Uh, I did want to mention one other one, though, Aslan, that I, I wrote about in the observations. But Daniel Lyons, the freshman, um, Tom Lang loves the kid. He's talked about him. He, you know, he said he's, it's been he, – he watches the lines more than we do. And he said on the, the Friday practice, the last Friday practice before spring break, Daniel Lyons really caught his eye a lot. Um, and then, yeah, I was watching him a, good, uh, you know, a pretty substantial bit on Tuesday. And, yeah, he, he, uh, he abused some blockers. And he did it in the 11 on 11 stuff too. It wasn't just one on one stuff. He, um, he, you know, he transformed it into the 11 on 11 too. Now, I don't know how much this kid's going to play, but he is, he looks really tough to block. And he's 283 pounds. He's certainly not that strong compared to the other guys he's playing with and against. But they have a real hard time even double teaming him. He was able to slip through some things. And the way Odell was yelling at him, I don't know, man. Odell was in a bad mood on Tuesday, or just in a, you know, a, let's get some stuff done mood, uh, because he wasn't taking any foolishness from anyone, and he was yelling even more than he normally yells. Um, and he was giving a lot of attention to Daniel Lyons. And like that old adage that we all heard from our coaches growing up, be worried when we stop yelling at you. Yeah. That means we just don't care anymore. Well, they really care. And Odell really cares about Daniel Lyons, because he got on to him a lot at the beginning of practice, and then that dude kind of dominated every one-on-one -on -one drill he was in. Now, again, he's not going up against uh, maybe the best lineman the whole time. But he's going up against scholarship guys, and he looked. I thought he looked really good. Now, he's again, he's 283 pounds. He doesn't have the body of a defensive tackle quite yet, so that gives him a... Like, I want to see if he can do it when he's 305 pounds. Can he still move like that? Because right now, man, he's, t he's just tough to stay in front of for a guard. He's a, he's a quick dude. Um, for that size, so yeah, I, I was I was really uh, impressed with him, um, and I, I didn't see him much on Friday. But Tom Lang said he was just as good on Friday. So again, that's a freshman before spring break and after spring break, stacking on two really good practices in a row. That's a positive sign because you, you would expect him to maybe be a little sluggish after his first spring break in college. So 
good for him. And then also, again, I got to mention him just because you. I assume most people want to know, Jared Verse, there are times when they can't block him. Again, not always going up against the guys that will start, but who he goes up against, they have a real problem with. There was a one-on-one -on -one drill with a scholarship tight end, and they have a bunch of them, so you can't even narrow it down. Um, he, he snatched him and threw him out of the way like he was a five-year-old child. And, you know, Jared Verse, it's the speed that you, you think about most and the, the explosiveness, which he does have. There's some bursts there. But that's some serious strength. Um, this is a tight end that is not new to the program. And he's, he snatched him out of the way like he was barely there, like he was snatching, like he was just pushing me out of the way. Um, and then he had the last two plays I think he was in, he had a tackle for loss and then a sack on back-to-back -back plays. Uh, beat Lloyd Willis pretty substantially both times. Lloyd, going to, hey. How come you drop Lloyd's name, but you won't mention the tight end? That's not cool. Well, because I said something. Uh, I didn't say he beat Lloyd Willis like a child. So, I, you know, right. once I compared the tight end to a child, I didn't want to I didn't want to name the tight end. Okay. Um, That's fair. Uh, but his number's in the 40s. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> well, there's a few of them, right? I think there's three in the 40s. Um, so, anyway, uh, but, yeah, he did the same thing to Lloyd Willis. And Lloyd Willis is a guy they might want to start at tackle. And uh, Jared Verse on two straight plays made him look not great. And again, with Lloyd Willis, that's it. it either it's going to kill his confidence, or it's going to make him a lot better because that. Well, those are the only two options, really. But you know, because you're going up against a, a pretty darn good guy, man. I think Verse might be legit. And uh, and you struggle with him early. Let's see what he looks like in well in a week from now. Can he stand? Like this is great for him. This is great. For, it, just like it was great for those linemen last year, probably didn't feel that way. When you're having to block Jermaine Johnson and Keir Thomas in a game, man, it's not going to get any tougher than that. Like, it really won't. Um, so that's good practice, man. That makes everybody better, and hopefully it helps with Lloyd Willis and whoever else is trying to block uh, Jared Verse in the coming weeks. Uh, last thing, and then we'll mention some baseball and be out. Uh, we're going to do a live show later today. What, 6, 7 o'clock? What do you want to do, Corey? Name it. I'll be weird, whatever. What do you think, 7 would be better, or is that when do. people are eating dinner? We'll do seven. We'll do seven. Okay. They'll, All right. They'll, perfect. They'll, they'll carve around or whatever. Yeah, so just uh, last thought, and we'll talk some baseball. Just, you know, we're mentioning so-and-so going up against so-and-so, whether that's a first team or a starter. You know, they're not running the starting 11 on defense Correct. that they want every right. single time right. when they're going up against Jordan Travis. And Jordan yeah. Travis doesn't have the five guys that are probably going to block for him in New Orleans. So, like, overall, what do you think that means for the team? Does that, does that make you even more encouraged that we're not seeing what we think are probably the 11 best guys on defense um, and the 11 best guys on offense going right now? I mean, is that, is, or does that kind of portend that maybe this thing's going to get even better once they figure out the place for everybody? Or is this kind of maybe as, as good as it's going to look because there are these kind of gaps in, in terms of talent they're going up against? Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I, I do think what's what's positive is that, um, you know, especially, and, you know, it's always the thing with spring practice. Like, okay, if a receiver made a great play or jumped over and won a 50-50 ball, well, that means your DB lost the 50-50 ball. So you can't be that happy about it. Um, and uh, so, so when it comes to this, I, you know, I have been encouraged that even when, you know, Jordan Travis might not have some guys up front uh, blocking for him every time that he, like you said, will be in New Orleans. And on the same token, the same thing with the defensive line. There are guys in there that might not be starting come New Orleans. But it's not a, to me anyway, it's not a crazy noticeable drop-off. Uh, there are times when they, you know, the, the guys that might be third teamers, they, they're just, A.J. Duffy's, they're, sometimes it's just blown up. It's just blown up. But with these other guys, when Tate's in there, when Tate's in there, he's not running for his life. Right. Correct. Last year, it felt like whoever, when it was McKenzie's Mil Milton's time to work with the second team offense, he was running for his life on every play. And same with Jordan Travis. Now the second team offensive guy, the second team quarterback, is not running for his life on every play. But then again, does that mean the defensive line is worse? You know, I don't know because I, I like some of the th the pieces they have up front, uh, but I don't know. I I just think they're trying to get as many guys up front in that front seven, especially, well, really the front four, working with working against the first-team offense as much as possible to just get them acclimated to it because they're going to need a lot of those guys to play. So, yeah, you don't need to put, you don't need to have Verse, Cooper, Lovett, whoever else, McClendon, on the field at the same time all the time. 
That will happen later on this year. That will happen in August and September. But right now, get these other, get Warner in there. Get him some work. Um, get Bri yeah, I don't know Briggs how much he did on. I mean, I know he's out there. We talked to him, but I don't know how much he did. But get those uh, get those other guys, younger guys, some work all across the defense. And I do think, I mean, they they might think they have a nice rotation on the defensive line of what like eight or eight or ten. Oh, also, what's his name? The Louisville transfer. Golly, I can't. Jared Jackson. Jared, Jared Jackson. Golly, Clark. In the story the other day, Ira had to catch it. I called him Jermaine Johnson, and I said he transferred from Baylor. I don't know what's going on with me. Uh, but anyway, so Jarrett Jackson, right? That's his name? Correct, yeah. He had a couple of plays that stood out, too, where he kind of died. And again, man, that's a big deal. You need that depth at defensive tackle, especially so when you see the Malcolm Rays and those guys making plays and being out there and running with the quote-unquote first team or against the what we think is the first team offense. That's I think that's good to see. I think that tells you they feel like they probably have a few more guys um, that they think can start or – not start, but can be in the rotation and give them uh, production. But, you know, we'll see. We'll yeah. see what I'm saying on Monday after the LSU game. Yeah, I'm just – it for as optimistic as we feel now, I just – I really think it's going to be almost completely different what we're going to see to a certain degree when they do start preseason camp. Because, again, man, like they're – the 11 guys that they're having on the quote-unquote first-team defense, that the defense is going up against Jordan Travis, I'm like, that guy's not going to be there. He's not going to be starting. Um, and it's not a knock on those guys. It's just the dudes that are here and that are proven are being kind of held out for some stuff. And it's like, man, this this defense might be looking a little bit shaky right now, but it's like, well, they're going to have three or four different guys totally infused yeah. in there. And the same in the offense. It's like we're looking at the sets they're running, and we're like, they're only going with this personnel right now. And when they are running that kind of personnel, they're not using that receiver. And, it, you know, this is, that's not a criticism of them. It's, to Corey's point, kind of about – them just trying to work in everybody, whether it's defensive linemen or it's receivers. But it's like, all right, we're, we're seeing some success back and forth on both sides of the ball. And, like, they're not even they're not even fully kind of geared up and tuned up to who they're going to be. So right. it's going to be a, it's going to be a fun offseason as we uh, keep things going. Um, as we transition and land this plane, Bo Knowles, first off, shout out to Logan. Logan from West Virginia moved down to Tallahassee, longtime Noel. I guess he got a job down here for the univer with the university. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but shout out to Logan. He was at practice, took a selfie with Corey and I. Yeah, did you see occasions. that? My selfie, I looked like uh, a demon. Like I looked as mad as anybody's ever looked in a picture. Oh. Um, and you looked happy. You're a better smiler. You're a better picture taker than I am. I just I'm looked. Face. I looked grumpy and and rude. Uh, Bo Knowles uh, posts on the FSU baseball forum. I'd like to think Aslan was on his laptop giving updates in the sixth inning when some nine and a half blonde came over and swept him off his feet. He shut it down and headed out. And hopefully, we hear the story on Wake Up War Champ. Uh, no, I'm sorry, man. I uh, don't have uh, any good, exciting story for that. I did stop updates in the sixth inning because Florida State was up seven to two and in cruising against UCF. They mm. were supposed to play them on Tuesday and Wednesday, but today's game is going to be uh, postponed already to cancel it because of the uh, forecasted rain. But Florida State wins on Tuesday night against UCF 10 to two bats come alive. Carson Montgomery, watch out a little shaky those first few weeks, uh, but he's strung together here. At least I think this is three, two quality starts and three pretty solid starts for him. Let me see what he went into. He went into the seventh inning last night. He pitched all. He pitched seven innings. Yeah, look at that, man. Yeah, seven innings, four hits, two earned runs, eight Ks. Um, that's a pretty encouraging development. Again, uh, I mean, I don't know if that's that's a luxury more than anything, really, because we do feel really good, obviously, about Parker Messick and Bryce Hubbard and what Ross Dunn's becoming. So um, that's just, but that's incredible, man. If if they have a borderline three that they have to just roll out there on on you know midweek series what that does for you flexibility wise in a regional um, and, you know, baseball, God's willing, you go to Omaha and you got to go through some really crazy kind of things. If you don't go to and O to start things off, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but right. um, what a great luxury. And one thing that I, I feel like we haven't talked enough about, and we've talked a lot about baseball, which I think is kind of cool, man, Jackson greens become a pretty solid overall player for this team this season. Uh, his bat was a little bit suspect last year, uh, but he had a, he had a solid night on Tuesday, one for two, had a ribby. He's mm -hmm. batting three seventeen right now, um, because I don't know what the plan was ultimately at second base. You know, Trayton Rank was a guy that was getting some burn earlier in the season, a true freshman. But I think Jackson Green's kind of successfully held them off. Jordan Carrion, who really should have ended the game 
on Sunday in whatever the thirteenth yeah. inning. Um, he had another double, I think, or he had a, he had a couple base hits. I think he was Tuesday. three for three. Was he? All yeah, right, with the double. Back. Yeah, he went three for three. Yeah. Um. So Reese Reese is starting to kind of produce. So um. You know, hopefully they can. I mean, UCF's a solid team, man. So that that was a good win, good midweek win, first midweek win of the season, or no, second. They beat Florida Gulf Coast the other week, but um, stacking dubs, man. Let's go. Yeah, that's uh, whatever that is. Four out of five they've won now. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest development obviously is is Montgomery. Um, that guy, uh, he you know he he wasn't right all of last year. Uh, I think he had an illness. He had some medical issue where he he never really recovered um throughout that season and then this season he still i think started he was still feeling a little bit according to meet uh mike martin jr sorry and then um and then yeah these last two starts in particular um have been really encouraging uh that guy you know there aren't there aren't many guys that pitch in midweek games that have that kind of i mean he's throwing 94 in the fifth inning sixth inning um you know he's still got to work on some stuff he walked two guys in a in one inning he kind of lets it he let it go a little bit he also gave up a, a two-run homer but he gave up four hits in seven innings and walk, and struck out eight yeah. that's that's good man that's really good that's dominant almost i mean that's that's a really good performance from him to go i'm sure that's a career high in innings pitched and when you have you know literally this past week just this past week your two best pitchers of the last four games where you're number three and you're number four. And you know what Messick and Hubbard are. And, you know, right now they all have, I, I think Messick has the highest ERA of the four of them. Messick, who's going to be a second round pick maybe, or a first round pick. I don't know. He's a, he's nasty. He's a really good pitcher. And he's got the highest ERA of their four starters right now. So that's, again, they, they are blessed with some starting arms. They've still got work to do in the bullpen to figure out what's what. But yeah, that was a that was a nice win. It was a nice win. You need as many midweek wins as you can get. You keep stacking those up. And I thought the best thing. I think they made. A, I think they brought in uh, Trenton Rank uh, to put play shortstop when the game was out of reach, and he made an error. But that was the only error. And what was cool is that Montgomery got nine ground balls. Like usually, Florida State's defense. They're. I mean, they're striking out so many guys that you don't even get to see what they're doing. But they made Logan Lacy made a great play at third. They had him at third and Brett Roberts DHing. Yeah. And uh, he made an incredible play at third. And uh, and Jackson Green made a nice play. Carry on made some, carry on smooth out there, man. He's he's the best shortstop they've had in a long time. Uh, I I don't even know who I don't know who was who who was the best one before him. Like he's really good defensively. So yeah, man, it's good to see because they were pretty ugly this weekend in the infield uh, or just overall with the defense. For them to have a one error game where the error was kind of when the game was out of where the game didn't matter. Um, it would buy a backup. Uh, that that's encouraging, man. They 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 still struck out thirteen times as an offense, but what are you going to do? Logan Lacy was four of them. Uh, he went zero for five with four strikeouts and left seven guys on base. That's not great, but he's a good hitter. So that was just a bad game for him. But yeah, man, um, still got some things you need to work on. But overall, Montgomery I think is definitely the biggest development. If he can be this guy or close to it the rest of the year in the midweek games, they will have a decided advantage in every Tuesday game they play. There just aren't many guys like, and this is a guy that next year, you know, he might be a, he might be the Friday night guy. I mean, we don't know. He might make that Luke Weaver jump. Um, he's just, you know, there's a lot of good, there's good guys in front of him right now. So that's really good for him for this season, for the team this season, but also just good for Montgomery's career in the future here and the, in the future for Florida state in the next two years. And if you're wondering, in the polls, Florida State's seventh in the D1 baseball poll. They're tenth in the USA Today coaches poll, eighth in Baseball America. Collegiate baseball has them 22nd. I don't know what that's about. Collegiate Maybe. baseball could just go jump yeah. off a bridge. Yeah, a long what are you doing? Sure. What do they have NC State? Where's NC State ranked? I don't know. I didn't check. I didn't check. And Florida State, uh, seventh in the RPI. That was before Tuesday's game. So, Are they really? Yeah. They're seventh in the RPI? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They were okay. 11th last week, so they moved up to 7th. Yeah. I think it helped Cal went on the road and won a series like against USC or something, so that really helped Florida State too. Yeah, They've won, I good. think. This is a good stat. Kurt Weiler from the Democrat brought this up. At the, the, I was so out of it on Sunday after that ridiculous game, I, I forgot to even mention this. But I think he said they won their first six series to start the season. Either their first, whatever, this, whatever that was with NC State. Yeah. I think maybe that was their fifth weekend series. But it's the we'll say fifth. They've won their five straight series to open the season. It's the first time they've done that since I think he said like 2016 or 15, something like that. Oh, like it's been a while. Like a 1989. Well, I mean, it's not so that long ago. I know. I part of me wanted to say 2006, 
And then I'm like, man, you might overshoot this by a decade. Don't say that. So, guys, it was either 2006, 2016, or somewhere in the middle. So it was a, it was a cool stat, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah, and it is five series. James Madison, Samford, Cal, Wake, NC State. So Yeah, but I don't know the last time they won their first five series. So I'm going to go ahead and say it was 1980. All right, right on. Yeah. All right, we'll be back live show later tonight, 7 p.m. on YouTube Eastern Time. Uh, before that, though, Jeff Cameron show, 1 to 3 o'clock. And uh, check out Warchant.com for more coverage from Tuesday's practice. Interviews with Dennis Briggs, uh, Treshawn Ward, Coach Mike Norvell are all up on our YouTube site. So go over and check it out. Corey and I, again, we'll see you a little bit later. Thanks for hanging out now, though. It's been Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.